Okay, we have some mics set up. If people have questions that they would like to ask Dr. Caldecott, we'll have a little more music at the close, so don't worry that we're going to leave you all musicless. But well, um, I don't think we should have any more music. I'm intervening. Yeah. I want people to stay with their feelings, because when you have music, it makes you feel happy and united, and I want you to stay with what I've told you and hold on to it. Don't lose it. Please, don't lose it. So I think no more music, if that's OK with you. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Collicott. Um, Paul Kangas here. Germany is shutting down all of its nukes. And the way they did it, or doing it, is they um, passed a solar payment policy that requires the utilities to pay 99 cents a kilowatt hour to homeowners who feed the solar onto the grid. In your talks, do you ever mention the example of Germany uh, creating this massive solar um, housing project, each house having 100 solar panels, and that way uh, they're able to shut down the nukes? They banned fracking this year using that. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't talk about nuclear power t today um, because actually nuclear power is is part and parcel of the nu nuclear weapons industry. And there was a psychologist in the Pentagon in the 50s, I think, it's in one of my books, who said we should get into the peaceful nuclear atom to make Americans accept nuclear weapons more readily. Um, it's an evil industry, uh, and all, all of your nuclear power plants should be shut down tomorrow. But the problem is you've got huge quantities of radioactive waste some isotopes last for a million years, and it's going to seep into the water supply of the food systems for the rest of time and cause epidemics of cancer, leukemia, genetic disease, and birth deformities in all future generations, um, not just humans, but animals and plants as well. To call it clean and green is obscene. So, yeah, Germany's been good. They've, they're saddled with a huge amount of waste. They buried a lot of their waste in a salt dome. I think it got even, and it's leaking, and they're having to dig it up now. It's like at WIP, the, the facility in, in Arizona. Um, so, <laughs> nuclear. I, I, I was mean, just hoping you might mention that as a solution, since Germany. Well, it is. is you've got you've you've got enough wind west of the Mississippi to supply the whole country with electricity if you upgrade your grid. You should have solar panels on every building in California. I mean, how dare you not? on every parking garage. So you park your car, your Tesla, you plug the car in, and you drive with solar electricity. You should be conserving 28% of the electricity you waste by leaving everything on. You should unplug everything at night. San Francisco the just passed this law requiring all new homes to have well, solar Well, why not power. old, old homes? Where's Jerry Brown? You should be retrofitting them right now. You could supply millions of jobs, like FDR with the New Deal. You could upgrade the economy, if that's important to you, um, and help to save the planet. You're absolutely right. So get on to it. And there's a lot of money to be made if you're only smart. Yeah. I've only been using solar for 26 years. Um, but what I wanted to bring up is the most important almost nuclear disarmament that we got on September 20, 1963, the day before I was born, John Kennedy went to the United Nations and called off the nuclear arms race, called off the Cold War, called off the space race and said we should go to the moon as a joint effort with the yeah. Russians. And one of the people who removed him from office two months later was General Curtis LeMay who bombed Hiroshima. And part of the reason that we haven't dealt with this is the collective PTSD we have as a society, knowing that we don't have three branches of government, we have two. We have the overt government we were taught about in school, and we have the covert intelligence operatives who are the real government. Obama came from the CIA, the Clintons worked with the CIA under George Bush the first, and these are, you will not hear this on NPR, you won't even hear it on Democracy Now. Okay, well we all understand that, we all know. But it's forbidden. Yeah, well, take it on and fix it. Don't... You, you understand? Well, there must be a way. I thought, what, what... You know, Susie and I went for a march on... What's the avenue? Venice. Uh, with Patch Adams, about 50 people stark naked. 
I was talking in the Herbs Lecture Theatre where the United Nations Treaty was signed. Next door was Gorbachev talking, and Patch Ad and, and it was Y2K, and there was a real fear that we could have a nuclear war by accident or meltdowns because of the computer rollovers. And the White House, they spent billions of dollars trying to fix it. And Patch went to the microphone, and, and the media were simply uninterested. And so Patch Adams said, I've been telling Helen since August we should take our clothes off and have a naked march. And I thought, oh, God, Patch. And I went to the microphone and I said, who'll go on a naked march? Almost every hand went up. <laughs> we came into this red velvet foyer. He got his gear off. I left my scarf on, which covered the naughty bits and my pearls. <laughs> Everyone else stripped stark naked and we led them out on Ven Venice. It was quite cold, but we didn't feel it. And someone ch started ch chanting, nudes, not nukes. <laughs> and I realised the human body is beautiful, be it fat, skinny, tall, whatever, beautiful. And how vulnerable the human body is to radiation. And that's what, how we treat our patients, you know, we get you to undress. It's a sacred profession. Um, and guys were driving by and they'd go, Ugh! pull up and start clapping. They didn't even know why we were doing it. We got to the corner, it was cold, so we, I didn't want to go to a, an American police station, you know, stark naked. So we came back and no one wanted to put their clothes on and you've never seen such a group of joyous people who'd done the right thing and, and it was, it was, um, it was beautiful. And then, of course, we were in the New York Times the next day because the media liked to see the naughty bits. They do. So why don't you organise so that in the, in the warm weather, you circle, <laughs> circle the Pentagon and take your clothes off and say, nudes, not nukes. Do you know what? You'd get in every single publication and television in the world. In the world. And you would embarrass those generals inside and all those others. You know, nudes, not nukes. I mean, that's just a thought to get the media involved because they won't touch it otherwise. And you know, I'll take my clothes off, I'll come with you. <laughs> yes? Dr. Caldecott, um, I have a qu not so much a question, but a um, maybe you can update me. I'm from Albuquerque. Speak loudly. Okay, I'm from Albuquerque, and I remember growing up during the Cold War, the Manzano Mountains is hollowed out as a nuclear facility. And if, rather, when they do drop the bomb, it would blow up all of New Mexico, Arizona, part of Colorado, Utah, and western Texas. Um, and it so terrified me growing up growing under that kind of a threat because I thought I was safe. <laughs> um, is there some sort of an update or is it even worse than I'm thinking? No, it's the same. But also know that all nuclear reactors are stationary nuclear weapons. Inside each is a, the equivalent of a thousand Hiroshima bombs. And there are 15 large reactors in Ukraine, including Chernobyl. 40% of the land mass in Europe is radioactive and will be for hundreds of years, if not thousands. I don't buy European food. You don't know what's radioactive. Never buy Turkish dried apricots or figs. Turkey got a hell of a fallout and sent all its radioactive tea to Russia because I was so annoyed with them. Um, but there's a war in the Ukraine. Easily, you could melt a nuclear power plant down with a missile or a bomb or cutting off the external electricity supply. You can't have nuclear reactors in a country that's at war. If Europe was covered with nuclear reactors as it is now in the Second World War, Europe would be uninhabitable for the rest of time. So just know that you've got sitting time bombs all around in your country. And it's the same, if not worse. Yeah. Let's go quickly, yeah. Oh, okay, uh, just uh, quick, the observation about uh, the Vietnam era, the China that uh, President uh, Nixon wanted to drop bomb. the bomb yep. on Hanoi, and he decided for the massive Christmas bombing. Uh, we have all our uh, Navy out there with our nuclear submarines. The ultimate of the Vietnam War was to regain China, yep. not just Vietnam. 
Uh, my question is, uh, the, the, the bomb is like the gun. They're both tools and for self-destruction. The question is, what is the tool used for? What industry? The industry is war. How do we define war? And the war, I've come simplified it to that um, war is the death, destruction, elimination, and ultimate an annihilation of the enemy. War is butchery. And war is butchery. Butchery. Now. I've just been at the Veterans for Peace conference, and these these kids are sent off as cannon fodder, you know, 18 or 19, hardly with any whiskers on their face, brought up with, I pledge allegiance to the flag and all this rhubarb. And they go and they say, see pigs rooting around in bodies of dead babies. And it just blows their mind. It's well, butchery. Thou shalt not kill. And this whole society is based on killing. And every... Congressperson um, is a corporate prostitute paid for by the military industrial complex. They've got, you know, for an F 35 or whatever these damn killing machines they made, the seats are made in Florida, the, s the straps are made in Massachusetts, the wheels are made, and so they're put in every congressional district and they say jobs, that's ridiculous. You don't have jobs to kill people. I'm sure Hitler said, well, we have to have jobs to make gas ovens. Uh, just one last uh, observation. Be quick. Okay, on, on killing, as you labeled uh, Cheney as a uh, sociopath, the actual killer, you become a psychopath. Yeah. Because you eliminate any feeling, yeah. any human feeling you have right. for anyone else. And that is the difficulty of bringing these young soldiers back to life. I know. Thank you. Let's be quick. Helen. Yep. Uh, I'm so delighted to be here. And here, you, you changed my life 33 years ago. Thank a doctor you. crossed the bed for me, and an unconscious patient said, Sharon, come with us. You've got to help us start PSR in the San Francisco area. I did. And, of course, in the Stanford area, and then in San Jose. And, and this has cha totally changed my life. I've spent the last 33 years working at the next at the face of, of where U.S. and Russia has its problems. And I'm still there. And... I have created a plan with the help of Jack Matlock, Ambassador Jack Matlock, and the, uh, the American Committee for East-West Accord, and a number of other people that will create a nationwide public awareness campaign in this country. And we must have it, and you must be the, the, on the front of it. And the, my question for you is, will you, some way or another, show us how we can have another first, epi uh, the last epidemic film? Because my friend and I, who's we here with me. We paid seventy-five dollars to get that film so that we could circulate it all over this entire area, and play we did. It, play it in every church. Yes, but we need a second one. We need one that's today. Why? It's all the same. Nothing's changed. But we need an update. What? It, we need an update of that. Well, film. no. Let me say there was a film of me giving a lecture in in New York with B-52s flying overhead. It's half an hour long, called "If You Love This Planet," made by the Canadian Film Board. Um, and it won an Oscar. Get that from the Canadian Film Board. The only thing that's different is the haircuts. Well, still, I, I don't. No, I think it, it works just as well, and people are absolutely numbed at the end of it. At any rate, I would get like, that and I would have like a look. To at give you my book that's about the last 33 years of my life, so you yeah. will know what's happened. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, N next. Um, there is like three obvious. Lift the mic up. Oh. Uh, I wonder if you could comment, take your pick on the inside job, 9-11, uh, the obvious one, but let's say the sending of the nukes to Cairo, Operation Pluto, the BBC documentary, Dead in the Water, to cover that one. And then I remember uh, a little over a dozen years ago mentioning to you that I had been arrested on Hiroshima Day where the nukes come from, 5300 Port Chicago Highway. That video is at Greg from Tracks at YouTube, and I beat them in federal court, but that also, the 44 explosion, um, the first detonation or uranium, unless you believe they tested an untested bomb at Hiroshima. So if we call them on their inside jobs, you short circuit these wars, especially 9-11. And that's so obvious with the third skyscraper. So what are you going to do? Well, talk about any of those three that you care to. And, you know, expose our American... Yeah, but love, love, I live in Australia. Mm -hmm. I'm not American. You are. This is your country. 
I'm not a shrink. They're in denial and rationalization. Well, do, don't argue with me. I've given you your marching orders. I'm 78. I'm going to be dead soon. I pass the torch to you. You either take it. You Go. No. Okay, next. My name is Herbert Weiner. I have a simple question. Yeah. Shouldn't the United States base its foreign policy on the UN Charter? <laughs> Absolutely. So what are you going to do about it? Well, I was thinking uh, maybe people could go to the local State Department branches and protest any form of social policy, go in a group, record the discussion, and then publicize it throughout. So will you organize that? Uh, if people are interested. No. Will you organize it? They will be interested if you're the leader. They'll follow you. If you speak your truth, you become a leader. And don't be afraid of what any, anyone thinks of you. Just speak your truth. You, no, wait a minute. Don't go. Do you promise me you'll do it? I have a lot on my plate. No, I'm... you've got nothing oh, else wait, that's important. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How many people in the audience are willing to do this? No, I'm asking you. Don't, don't bifurcate what I'm All asking. All right, let me answer your question. No, I, I don't want to. No, you answer my question. I will do it in my own way. Okay, thank you. Yeah. My name is Marcia Peterzell, and I'm a community activist. I'm 78 also. I'm a great-grandmother. Wonderful. And I'm worried. Yes, oh, so am I. So what I've been reading is The Next American Revolution by Grace Lee Boggs, where she talks about how the racism, materialism, militarism can only be defeated when we're willing to sacrifice. Those of us who have taken advantage of the system all these years who've had the advantages, and I'm Jewish, so I'm a funny white person. I've got two consciousness. One is an oppressed person, and one is a liber, uh, uh, you know, whatever. You know, <laughs> my point, so what, thank you. So I work with an organization called Community Living Campaign, and what we work with is seniors. And what we're tr attempting to do is empower seniors so that we can be more engaged and more active. And I want to urge everybody here to do what Grace Lee Boggs tells us to do and what you're telling us to do, which is to be introspective, to look at ourselves. What kind of legacy do I want to leave? What is the message I'm giving to my friends, family, neighbors, church members, synagogue, mosque, whatever? What am I doing every day to make a more peaceable world? Thank you. And I challenge us each to do that. And thank, thank you so much for you. all your work. Hi there. Um, could you speak to what's going on at UC Berkeley? I heard they have like a small reactor there and they're part of this, you know, they're connected to Livermore. Do you know? Yeah, I think they do, don't they? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, they've got a small reactor. MIT's got a small reactor. Yep should be closed down. They're the nuclear nuts. Hi, Dr. Caldecott. Um, I'm teaching in a San Francisco public school. Yeah. The students are mostly refugees from Central America and migrants, and we aim to try to imbue social consciousness um, through different things that we teach. Speak right into the mic loudly. From in a San Francisco public school with students who are Central American refugee yeah. families, and we do infuse social and political curriculum and do exchange programs with other kids who are refugees in other parts of the world. Do you have any suggestions for us as educators about other ideas we can use with youth to get them involved in what's going on in the world? Thank Educate you. Educate them. <laughs> get my film, If You Love This Planet, and show it to them. If you love this planet, go to the Canadian Film Board. You can download it, yeah, on, uh, yeah, and show it to them. You've got it. What you have to do is shock them into reality. Look at what I did with you today, and a lot of people have left, unfortunately. But it's like I've, t I'm your doctor, and I've told you you've got pancreatic cancer. Your CT scan shows it. 
and that you might have six months to live. It's what I've done. So, so you've got to understand the gravity, the profound gravity of the situation. And, and so, I mean, I'm driven. I've been driven all my life. When I first read On the Beach, when I lived in Melbourne and the whole city was annihilated in a nuclear war, and the whole world was, I lost my virginity. I lost my innocence. Then I went to medical school, first year medical school, I learned about genetics, radiation, mutation. And Russia and America were testing bombs like there was no tomorrow in the atmosphere. They knew what they were doing. 114,000 people in America got thyroid cancer, but God knows how many other cancers were caused by that. They're killers, they're murderers, they should be in jail. We don't lock up the criminals. We lock up people who smoke a little bit of dope, which is a damn good drug better than alcohol, and smoking. <laughs> All drugs should be made legitimate. Yes. And, we should, and, and we should be treating the people who are drug addicts, because they're sick. And we shouldn't have any homeless people in the streets who are psychotics, who are addicts, who are, you know, they need to be in homes cared for and loved and bathed and looked after. After Reagan emptied all the mental hospitals, that's what happened. Go, sorry. Like many people in this world, I grew up learning to duck and cover for the nuclear bomb, you know. For the past 30 years, I've been working with children with art because I think that learning to counteract the effects of the machine are really, really important. Learning that two different colors make a third color or, or a multitude of colors. Kind of like the woman before me, what can we do for children? Children can be terrified by everything they hear. And of course, all of their hyperactivity is in some sense a reaction to this. What kinds of things well, have you seen that children themselves are doing? I'll tell you, during the 80s, children would say, there won't be a nuclear war because my mummy and daddy go to meetings every night to stop it. If the children see us taking responsibility for them, we can't do anything more for them. That's what we must do. It's our fault. We've brought this on the planet in our lifetime, and it's our responsibility, not these dear little innocent things, to fix it for them. So, oh, apart from your lovely teaching and the colours and art, get out at night and do what you have to do. Think about it, OK? Yeah. No more at the queue. That'll be enough, OK? Yeah? Yeah, I remember when uh, John Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev were about the only people who had the power to kill us all, and now it's spread from there. Uh, I'm in the job of Iran, the Kim Sakria, these psychotics have the power to do this, and governments can't be trusted. That's how these people rise to the top. Uh, they can't be trusted to get rid of atomic weapons. Somebody's going to hide them. Somebody's going to keep them. Uh, one world government, there'll be people, psychotics in charge of that then, and one of the biggest boons to all civilization with separation of church and state. I so what's your question? My, my, my point is this, you know, taxes pay for nuclear weapons, taxes pay for wars, taxes, it's stop paying your taxes. And that we, won't we, work. Excuse me, no, uh, uh, nothing else has worked. We don't need necessary taxes to pay for sidewalks and streets that always come up or take care of the poor. And that's the best way to keep plutonium and uranium in the ground is when it takes tremendous amount of government interference, influence. Okay, and, uh, and but you anyway. didn't ask me a question. Well, well you, we can make comments, and you can make comments. No, no, because you've, you've had enough okay, time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, to Helen. Thank you so much for setting an example for the rest of us. Um, I'm Kay. Uh, I would like to also include the San Francisco Grey Panthers to the list that we didn't make it somehow. Um, I, uh, what's, what I'm seeing this year is most of the major books talking about all this really horrible stuff we're doing is, is why are we letting them do it? Yeah. It's, it's one I ask myself and I look, what can I do? Because the, the, the obedience, the silence, it reminds me of Incredible. something that, that somebody told me, Kathy, as we were driving in. America's a cult. If you've ever been in a cult, and I've been in two cults, um, 
Everyone follows orders. Everyone is obedient, like the Jim Jones cult, where over 900 people committed suicide by drinking the cyanide, cyanide lace Kool Aid vat. That's what America's doing. It's a cult. Pledge allegiance. You know, at every ball game, there were fly it, the, the planes flying over, there are flags. I remember after 9-11, I'd just flown into Eau Claire, Wisconsin to speak at the university. And I got up in the morning and there the planes flew in and I thought, my God. I walked across the campus for a swim and a woman approached me and she said, do you believe in Jesus? And I said, I'm an atheist. And she literally psychologically slammed me in the face and she said, you'll go to hell. And I thought, what sort of campus is this? <laughs> then I got out the Bible because I thought that might be appropriate. And all these kids marched in, hundreds of them ashen-faced. And I read to them, um, shucks, it's from Luke. Love thy neighbour, do good to those who hate you. Love thine enemy, do good to those who hate you. And then I got a, a, a Greyhound bus across America three days later because there were no planes flying except those to take the Bin Laden family back to Saudi Arabia. And the whole country was swathed in flags and I thought, please, no vengeance. But you could feel this nationalism and the need for vengeance. And I'm afraid that's where people are, aren't they? And unless they're inspired by someone truly great like FDR. Or Jesus, who was a great psychiatrist. I mean, he wasn't... If you'll pardon me, he was a Jew and his mother wasn't a virgin. I mean, let's be frank. You might be offended by that, but that's the truth. <laughs> but he was a great psychiatrist. And what he said has lived down the ages. And what he preached, if we all lived like that be pretty damn good, but we need a leader who inspires us with, I don't know, love is not the right word, is it? No, no, like Joan of Arc, except she fought and killed, but an absolute determination to save the planet, and that's what I've always had, no door remains unlocked, if it's Locked, I go through the side door, that back door, or I get in to see whoever I have to see. It's always a way. There's always a way. There's always a way. But wait and see what your psyche tells you to do. Stay with the pain. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you for uh, giving me the answer when the when the discussion always turns to the despair, you know, you start going down global warming, you start going down the nuclear thing, and you end up in just, oh my God, how do we get out of this hole? And I always like to quote you, because about 30, I don't know, 20, 20 I don't know, you told one time about, you talked about uh, population control, and your solution was, was so brilliant. It is absolutely <laughs> perfect, and I hope you know what I'm referring I to, do. and I would love to hear you say it again. Oh, well, you put... It was just... Put, it you, is always the answer. You put birth control pills in the water and what stimulant... And what else did it... Was, I, it was your... your Aphrodisiacs. It was, it was ecstasy in RU-487. That's and it, right. And, so, and, and when it gets down to there where there's no place left to go, I say, well, this is what Helen Gallicott says. To do. <laughs> and from there, we can lift it back up. <laughs> You know, so I want to just I, thank There you. is one very important thing that's happening, though, and it's Trump. And he's starting to say, you know, well, why can't we use nuclear weapons? And for the first time for about 20 years, the New York Times is starting to write Sanger and Broad about the button and the, and the um, football and how a nuclear war could start for the first time, because people are getting scared, because Hillary said, what if he gets his finger on the button? Well, what if she gets a finger on the button? <laughs> and incidentally, I'll have to tell you, there are three alternatives the president has. Counterforce is to strike their missile silos. Countervalue is to just hit all the cities. And the third one is to hit both cities and missile silos. Three options all of which would end life on the planet. Yeah, Hi. last um, but not least. Thank you for coming and speaking with us. Um, I um, have a really basic question that I 
that I just don't have an answer to. Okay, just what is it? Why do people make up the word nuclear rather than saying the word nuclear? Because George Bush said it. Is it, is it really that that's simple? A, that's I mean, a, he had a speech defect and he said nuclear and everyone says nuclear. How many people, how many people in this audience say nuclear? Raise your hand. Nuclear. <laughs> okay, that, it's, that's it's okay. Not, it's not a word. That's a good point to end on. And look, it, I... It could, it, could, it could also be the, the name of your next book, too. Okay, so I think I'm signing some books afterwards, right? And, uh, and I thank you for being such a lovely audience. And I pass the flame to you.